Harry's wife. The trouble with Prince Harry. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. As I've explained to you before, people are viewed as appliances by my kind. You are objects that are there to be used. You're like toasters, television sets, computers. You are expected to do what we want, when we want, and to do so without complication, in the same way that when I switch my television set on, I expect to be able to watch programmes, and when I switch it off, I expect it to fall silent. When I use my toaster, I expect it to toast the bread to exactly the level of toasty delight that I have set it to. I do not expect it to reject the bread and say, fuck you, I'm not toasting this today, or toasting it beyond the level of my tolerance for the level of crispiness. We view people this way so that in effect you are these appliances that are there to be controlled and you should be under control, know your place, you should provide us with fuel, and where we deemed it appropriate, either consciously or subconsciously, you provide us with the character traits and residual benefits also. You are an extension of us, especially where you are a primary or secondary source. A tertiary source is, but it's fleeting in nature. And the intimate partner primary source is the biggest extension of the narcissist. We do not attach ourselves to you, because that would shackle us and would be a threat to control. That's why we reject intimacy. However, we attach you to us. We bolt you on. And therefore, you become an extension of us. All aspects of your personality and character can be utilised by us. Your achievements can be commandeered by us. But also, your failings can impact upon us in terms of challenge or wounding also. And therefore, the forthcoming book, Spare, and the publicity that surrounds it with the two interviews with 60 Minutes and on ITV, are important for Harry's wife because she stands or falls by virtue of how the Prince of Pink Pancakes is being perceived. So far, not so good. As I explained in my video yesterday, they are losing. And the way that his two forthcoming interviews are received, and the way that Spare is reviewed and received, not only, of course, impacts upon Harry, but then impacts upon Harry's wife, because he is an extension of her. If it meets with critical and commercial acclaim and success then that's her critical and commercial success. She wins. If the interviews are viewed as a triumph, then she's validated. She gains fuel because it's talking about her and him, and his triumph, the success of the interview, is commandeered by her as a consequence of the lack of boundary recognition, sense of entitlement, and absence of accountability. But of course, it's not all one-way traffic. If it transpires that people poo-poo the interviews and criticise Harry, then... Furthermore, indirectly, she is also criticised because he is an extension of her. Remember, they have forged this shared fantasy together, which she created and drew him in. And therefore, if people are turning around and saying, oh, these two, what a pair of whingers, and oh my God, have you heard him banging on again about his dead mum, etc. The fact that he is bolted onto her as the intimate partner primary source presents a problem for her as a consequence of criticism of him. And unfortunately for Harry's wife, though none of you will be exhibiting any sympathy for her, the criticisms of his behaviour, the forthcoming interviews, the trailer teasers that have been provided so far, are mounting up. Julie Burchill in The Spectator writes, The promotional clip trailing Prince Harry's upcoming interview which has kicked off the publicity trail for his forthcoming memoir, Spare, made for sobering viewing. This is a man who actually seems smarter as a young squaddy than he now does as an adult father of two. Zing. Back then, dressing up as a Nazi could be countered by a nice chat with the chief rabbi. Ignorance could be corrected. There was always the chance of moral and cerebral, I won't say intellectual, progression.
But now, with psycho babble leaking from every orifice, there seems absolutely no way this apparently brainwashed Californian vessel will ever find its way back to anything resembling the path of common sense. Though Harry talks a lot about growth, this was a portrait of a, long, uh, of a lost young man for whom the getting of wisdom is about as likely as Harry's wife serving up a full English with builder's tea for breakfast. For Harry to be the hero of his own story, those who oppose him in any way must be painted as villains. For where is the epic journey if everyone involved is simply a well-meaning flawed human trying to do their best and sometimes getting it wrong? Thus Prince Harry says the royals have shown absolutely no willingness to reconcile with him and his wife, and that though he wants to get my father back and get my brother back, he requires a family, not an institution. This is not the opening gambit of a man who sincerely wishes to muddle through to some sort of compromise with alienated relations. This is a man setting out his stall, a St. George come to slay an archaic dragon. As well as having a hero complex, white saviour, well, in actual fact, it's white knight syndrome, to coin a social justice phrase, when he starts on about rescuing his wife from the evil racist tabloids, this, of course, is a manifestation of his emotional empathy, which harnesses both his traits of compassion but also pride, anger, argumentativeness, caring. Harry exhibits symptoms of something worse. He almost resembles someone in the grip of a cult, the paranoia, the grandiosity, the isolation. Considering how much he bangs on about mental health, he doesn't seem tremendously healthy himself. Those are, of course, all accurate observations from Julie Birchill. Harry is, in effect, in the grip of a cult. It's a cult of two. She's the leader, he's the follower. She's created this folly of dough and drawn him into it, the shared fantasy that I've explained about in Parts Pass Him. Birchall continues, in the clip he thankfully isn't wearing the black jumpsuit and beaded, neck, beaded bracelets combo he sported on the cover of Time, where he resembled an aide-de-camp come hairdresser, reassuring his foxy client that she could 100% carry off layers. But his navy jumper has the air of the institution about it, and someone's obviously taken his ties away, just in case. Harry has that urgent yet unfocused luck, which cult members often have, of having been off some place that makes planet Earth look like a one-horse town, of knowing something which would come as a great revelation to the rest of us, but must be communicated little by little lest it blow our tiny minds. Prince Charles has typically been considered the eccentric member of the royal family for many years. Harry now makes his poor old dad seem as normal as Mike Tyndall. Barely able to conceal his excitement as he darkly refers to the leaking and the planting, which takes place within the firm, it reminds us of a more innocent age. Back then, a prince who talked to plants was as wacky as it got, rather than a prince who talks to the global media about how much he claims privacy, which is a whole other level of lunacy. Harry talks about having a family as if it is the Holy Grail, rather than the rather basic living arrangement which humankind has chosen to hang out in since the dawn of time. But in elevating it, he may well be letting it slip through his fingers. He already has a family, but this family has proved itself all too human, a place where members argue and shout. And yes, unless multiple births took place, take place, then it's highly likely that some siblings will be older than others. Maybe Harry has heard that female cats can have up to eight kittens at once and believes that the more democratic practice should be adopted by the House of Windsor. What families certainly aren't are setups wherein members are paid money to denounce other members ceaselessly, as that generally ends up with show trials and general unpleasantness. But the Sussex's thoroughly modern mantra of always complain, always explain is in real danger now of not preaching to the choir. Their comfort zone, but rather preaching to the bread line leading to the soup kitchen. With 2023's economic tsunami about to break, even their natural allies on the world stage, which they so yearn to caper upon, are turning on them. I couldn't help thinking, as this desperately desiccated man 
takes yet another step down the yellow brick road of a quote from the Wizard of Oz. No matter how dreary and grey our homes are, we people of flesh and blood would rather live there than in any other country, be it ever so beautiful. There is no place like home. Prince Harry had a home and he had a family. What he now has looks very much like an institution, right down to the 16 toilets. Sage observations there from Judy Burchill, which, of course, are fair observations about where he's found himself as the victim of the narcissist. But such an article would also be problematic for Harry's wife because it shows that Harry is seen as a captive, that Harry is making mistakes, that Harry is behaving like a tosser. And as a consequence of him being an extension of Harry's wife, that does not make Harry's wife look good either. The narcissist does not like it when their extensions are being criticised. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.